but uh, you know, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> we we start. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We are here today to present the John Pace book, The United Nations Commission on Human Rights, a very great enterprise, published by Oxford University Press. This is a joint initiative of the Human Rights Center Antonio Papisca of the University of Padova, Global Campus of Human Rights, and the Veneto region. It is a great honor for me to welcome our friend and colleague, John Pace, who has carried out the delicate function of the Secretary of the United Nations Human Rights Commission for 15 years, from the late 70s to the early 90s of the last century. These were fundamental years for the development of the process of international recognition of human rights. In 1975, the Helsinki Final Act was adopted. Several international human rights legal instruments were also adopted and entered into force in this period. Among others, the two international covenants, respectively on economic, social, and cultural rights and on civil and political rights. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against the Women the Conventions Against Torture, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Then we recall the declaration and the action plan of the World Conference of Human Rights in Vienna in 1993. John, Patch, John Pace was from the big stage, one of the protagonists of this intergovernmental conference. On the other side, the protagonist of non-governmental forum, All Human Rights for All, was Professor Manfred Novak with the Ludwig Bolsam Institute of Human Rights. It was a very fertile period during which the universal building site of the United Nations with the Human Rights Commission at his center drew up always have in mind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what Antonio Papisca called the first part of a world constitution. John Pace was also the director of the United Nations Human Rights Center established in 1982, the same year in which Professor Antonio Papisca established the Human Rights Center at the University of Padova. Between 1989 and 1995, John Pace came to Padova several times to meet the student at the three-year postgraduate school of specialization in institution and techniques for the protection of human rights. I remember that his arrival was preceded by sending of a large package containing the collection of international instrument of human rights for our students. Human rights law was beginning to enter the university. Today, I also have the honor of welcoming Professor Manfred Nova and Professor George Ulrich, among the most authoritative scholars and animators in the field of human rights. Manfred and George were two extraordinary masters and travel mates together with Antonio in the wonderful adventure of the European Master on Human Rights and Democratization that led to the creation of the European Inter-University Center for Human Rights and Democratization first, and then of the Global Campus of Human Rights, which is which, which is now the largest global education network on human rights and democracy. Finally, I welcome Arianna Saulini, chairholder of the Save the Children Chair, Children's Rights, my colleagues from the University of Padova, Paola Degani and Paolo De Stefano, De Stefani, and all the participants in this seminar. John Pay's book is a volume of over 800 pages that tells with great accuracy 
the work undertaken by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights and subsequently by the Human Rights Council since 1947. It is a fundamental book for understanding the impressive work done by the United Nations in human rights standard setting and monitoring. In today's meeting, the focus will be on human rights education, formally launched in 1988 by the Commission, by the UN Commission on Human Rights. What has been the progress? How has academia influenced for the progress of the human rights program? I leave these questions to our distinguished speakers. Now, I am happy to give the floor to Manfred Nova, Secretary General of the Global Campus of Human Rights. I thank you, Manfred, for having accepted to introduce and coordinate this meeting. You have the floor, Manfred. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. And uh, thanks for you and uh, the Human Rights Center at the University of Padua do <clears throat> having organized this, uh, uh, I think, important meeting. When I heard there is a new book by John Padge about the United Nations, Nations Commission on Human Rights, and that is actually launched this book in Padua. I said, I, I, I have to be there um, because um, um, as we just tried to, to look back, um, I, I know John more or less forever. I think it was the late 70s or early 80s um, that I started to be regularly in um, in Geneva, attending the commission as part of government uh, delegations, but then as independent expert. And whenever you have been at the commission, John was there. So you couldn't be in Geneva, you couldn't be at the Human Rights Center at, uh, as the, the Office of the High Commissioner was called at that time um, without running into, into John. You couldn't be at the at a non-governmental organization meeting, and he was there as well. So he was uh, omnipresent. And I would say if I, if and, and, and I should say, I, as soon as I, I got access to, to your book, I, I started to read. I started to read with the, uh, the very, very detailed table of contents. And then I couldn't stop anymore because I always had them to say, oh, he's also writing on this. Then I had to look what he actually is writing. And so I was always getting, going back and forward. And it was, I spent almost the whole night because I simply couldn't, couldn't uh, stop reading. Um, it's, it's an amazing, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of an encyclopedia. I've, I've never seen something like this and that one person can write this uh, I, I don't know how you did it, but uh, it's, it's, it's for me amazing. And I would like to, <clears throat> to cite one short paragraph uh, uh, of John in his own introduction, where he said, the delicacy of my task was to reconcile the inevitable reaction of frustration at the lack of progress with the hopes and noble objectives of the human rights system. There was no better way than to let the historic and actual reality speak for itself. Hence, the approach taken in this book. So John doesn't interpret. He simply looks at it, looks at all the documents from the beginning to the end, the beginning in 1946, even going back to, the, to 1944, uh, until the end of the commission in 2006, but he then also goes on to look at the Human Rights Council as the successor of the Human Rights Commission until uh, very recent when the book was, was actually finalized and published. And it's an, <clears throat> it's an encyclopedia if you want to know what happened in a particular body of the subcommission on a particular substance, um, you, will, you will find everything in there simply on the basis of United Nations documents, not on the basis of literature, um, and not on the basis of your own recollection and your own assessment, whether this was a successful or a less successful uh, meeting. And um, <clears throat> of course it follows, it's called the Commission on Human Rights, a very great enterprise. 
And I think it's a little bit taken from the famous book of John Humphrey, the United Nations, Human Rights, a Great Adventure. Um, and of course, John Humphrey paid a very, played a very important role. Um, and this book uh, is really getting, of course, John Humphrey was the first director of the Division of Human Rights, uh, still a young Canadian lawyer in 1946. Uh, and he was actually drafting, he made the first draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and then he was in there, he was also the secretary of the commission uh, in the, in, at, at the beginning. Um, and he was there at the time of the declaration. And then when the two covenants, the racial discrimination convention uh, were drafted, et cetera, in the first kind of 20 years. <clears throat> and that was exactly the point when John, joined the Human Rights Division in January 1966. So at the time, <clears throat> uh, the same year when the two covenants were adopted, just after the Racial Discrimination Convention had been adopted in the middle of the decolonization, one of the most uh, important uh, developments uh, in the United Nations relating to, to human rights. Um, and you were also secretary of the commission for, for, for 16 years. Um, and that was the time, late 60s, uh, when the commission stopped its so-called no power to take action doctrine. Until that time, <clears throat> we had hundreds of thousands of petitions, individual petitions, and the commission simply said, we don't have any kind of power to do that. We first need to have treaties and treaty bodies. We can't do anything. But then came South Africa. Uh, and in South Africa in 1967, so immediately after you started, that the commission first established this working group on human rights violations in Southern Africa in South Africa, then later Palestine and, and, uh, and Chile. So that broke the ice. Uh, they were the three outcasts, but that was the beginning of the special procedures. Um, the country specific like these, <clears throat> and later since 1980 with the working group on enforced disappearances, the thematic special procedures. Um, and that was, I think, a, a very, very um, interesting period uh, because that was really undermining the very idea of state sovereignty, Article 27 of the, of the UN Charter, that uh, investigating human rights was no more seen as directly interfering with uh, domestic jurisdiction and state sovereignty. Um, <clears throat> and then the 1980s was with the thematic procedures. It was, uh, there were different heads then of the Human Rights Center. Some were more successful than others, I should say. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and that led up then to the end of the Cold War. Um, and uh, of course, many treaties, most of the treaties were drafted by the commission and adopted at that time. Uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and Migrant Workers. It was all in that time leading up then to the World Conference. Um, and I still see <clears throat> John sitting in his office in the Austria Center uh, and telling me that, uh, yeah, you have invited the Dalai Lama, but um, I, I can't help you. The Chinese simply don't want the Dalai Lama to come into the Austrian center and speak. And I said, are you crazy? Uh, I mean, you cannot support that, but I mean, as a civil servant, you have to, to try to find, uh, <clears throat> to find compromises. So uh, the same was with Nasser Arafat, Yasser Arafat and, and, and many others of the people whom we invited to the NGO forum. Um, and, um, and states didn't want them to speak. But finally, we managed. We managed together, and I think the, um, the NGO input into the World Conference and finally the Vienna Declaration uh, and Program of Action was, uh, was very successful. I think without the NGO pressure at the World Conference, we wouldn't have a High Commissioner for Human Rights um, and uh, we wouldn't have human rights of women as human rights, uh, uh, special rapporteur and declaration of violence against women and many other things that came out uh, of the Vienna uh, World Conference. So for me, that was a 
a great adventure. I was almost at a burnout at, at the end uh, to coordinate 1,500 NGOs and uh, uh, with more than 3,000 delegates and all having their, their own agendas. But it was, uh, for us, it was a great, uh, a great development. And that was also the time when the Human Rights Commission, also the, the Human Rights Education uh, was really promoted by the uh, by the World uh, Conference, and then we had a decade on human rights education, where we will hear much more than uh, of, of of John. Um, <clears throat> so the point that I'm making, when you <clears throat> were leaving the United Nations by the end of '99, and uh, going to the University of New South Wales becoming uh, an academic and uh, and writing books like like this wonderful book um, the human rights commission was already in a very difficult stage uh, so more and more uh, there was criticism and then after 9 11 it became even stronger this criticism um, that the human rights commission is too politicized it's too selective which of course is nonsense uh, if you are talking about a, a body consisting of governments of course it is political um, and that was the main reason why the human rights commission was then uh, abolished and uh, Kofi Annan in in his report in larger freedom has uh, proposed the human rights council and then there were the big hope so now finally we get a non-politicized um, new body the human rights council now if you look <clears throat> into the practice of the Human Rights Council, I would think it's much more politicized than the commission actually ever has been. But again, it's uh, difficult to, to avoid and the Human Rights Council also has certain new features like the Universal uh, Periodic Review, which I think is a, is a great uh, achievement because all 193 states are uh, subjected to this kind of universal peer review by by the uh, by the by, by other states but also by, by NGOs and uh, and by, by human rights experts so uh, so I think uh, I think you were at the high time of the commission um, a very very uh, important figure running the commission uh, for as I said for 16 years but all the time being somehow involved with the commission so there's nobody better qualified to write this uh, encyclopedia about the very great enterprise of the of the commission on on, on human rights uh, um, at the last point when the commission ended i was special rapporteur on torture <clears throat> and i almost lost my job because of that uh, because uh, that was the time when the Many states from the, the global south were actually um, clearly saying we need to have a, a good uh, kind of assessment of the special procedures. There are too many of those special procedures running around and they are selective and politicized and whatever. Um, and we really have to put them under, under an assessment. So all of a sudden, those who were there, who were called to be the, the eyes and the ears, uh, of the commission in order to do independent fact finding, so assessing the state's human rights situation, all of a sudden it was turned around. We, the states, have now to assess whether these independent experts are actually doing a good job or, or not. Uh, and as I said, uh, Philip Olsen and myself, Philip was at that time summary executions and I was torture. Uh, we were the two ones that um, almost didn't survive this. Uh, restructuring of the special procedures, but finally we did. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, only a couple of country-specific special rapporteurs were discontinued, but not the thematic ones. And, uh, and those two are still uh, consisting, as to many others, it was even an increase in the, in the special procedures in the, in the meantime. So it is a great adventure. Uh, we are today in not in the easiest time, not uh, the time uh, when we had so much optimism in the time when you were running the commission. Um, but it, it remains a very, a very interesting journey. As you said, there's a lot of frustration 
because there's a lot of hope and uh, expectations that might be sometimes a little exaggerated and that leads to frustration. Uh, but um, the human rights program of the United Nations will survive that and will continue. So I am, at the end of the day, I, I remain to be optimistic and uh, perhaps if the United States is again coming back, so they withdrew under George W. Bush, came back under, under Obama, then Trump again withdrew and Biden is coming back. Um, um, I think it's a positive sign and perhaps also the financial situation will become a little bit better of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and that of course means also for the Commission and the special procedures. So thanks for giving me the floor for this uh, short reflection or perhaps too long reflection on the book um, and, um, and uh, my admiration for what John has done during all his time serving uh, the United Nations uh, for 34 years almost uh, until the end of the century. Thank you and I look forward to listen to your speech and then we will have a discussion uh, <clears throat> with four speakers and the discussion, uh, I, I would not restrict it to only human rights education, it should be on, of course, your speech, the human rights education, but also if we can discuss certain aspects of the Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Council, it would be great. So I hand back to Marco or directly to John, uh, if that's fine, uh, that John will give us uh, an account on the human rights education as it started in the work of the Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manfred. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, it is a very um, a moving moment for me, uh, I must say, um, to be among so many dear colleagues um, and to see so many new faces and new names. Uh, I am uh, flattered and humbled really, because when I set out to prepare the book, uh, the reason I had was rather mundane. I wanted to develop a tool for me to use in my teaching. And uh, at that time I was teaching a, a training program for the DTP, the diplomacy training program from University of New South Wales in Nepal. And it was the, oh, the class was made up of young NGOs from South Asia and Southeast Asia and uh, started putting it together. And, uh, and uh, I mentioned it to my dear friend, Philip, one day, and he said, what on earth are you wasting your energy for? Do a real book, said he. So I set out doing what, this real book and uh, it took over my life for a few years, I must say. Uh, the technique was uh, quite interesting. You know, the book has about I think nine or 10,000 documents that are cited in it. And it has about, uh, I don't know how many thousands of footnotes and so on. But uh, recently, a dear friend of mine from Australia said that he had received complaints from friends saying the book is too long. And I quickly answered him to say, actually, that is the short version because uh, the original manuscript ran to about two or 300 pages more and OUP wasn't having that, which is good. But I, I think it was quite a lesson. Anyway, and uh, thanks to, to that, I have been um, the approach that uh, uh, Manfred has rightly pointed out. I am compensating with the second book, which is at the moment on hold because of our, of our virus and our, all other activities that are, are being undertaken, where I am uh, less uh, modest about, about my thinking about what happened <laughs> during those years. But I think it's necessary because as I prepared this this book, I needed to uh, kind of uh, list somewhere else what I really felt about what was going on. But I, I treasure very much uh, the, um, the fact that the readership and the users of, of the book uh, are now free to form their own opinion as to whether things were good or bad or could have been better and so on. Uh, so that's a source of satisfaction. I'm very moved that uh, Manfred picked that up. I, uh, I'll pass to uh, the subject today, but I, I, I do wish that it would be possible to 
uh, to touch upon other issues. But the, I think uh, the, the subject that uh, you have selected today is very significant because it actually uh, is, the, is the backbone of a much wider network of human rights activity. And uh, since I was quite closely involved with its development, uh, as you know, in the 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, I needed to share one or two uh, thoughts today. Um, anyway, so speaking of education first, as distinct from human rights education, I think it's important to uh, recall that it was the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities that first addressed the right to education in the early 1950s. Uh, relations between the Subcommission and the Commission on Human Rights passed through various phases during their existence. Uh, and at that particular moment in the early 50s, the Commission was deep in the drafting of the covenants and, uh, and had really not very much time for the Subcommission. Uh, however, to its credit, the Subcommission persisted and uh, managed to obtain approval for the preparation of its first two studies in its history, one of which was on discrimination in education. Uh, the study included 10 principles, which the Commission took up eventually in 1959. And the following year, in 1960, UNESCO adopted the Convention and Recommendation Against Discrimination in Education. In 1968, the International Conference on Human Rights, the Tehran Conference, adopted a resolution on the education of youth on respect for human rights. And in 1971, the Commission urged further focus, including dissemination of materials on in schools and familiarization with the work of the UN on human rights. That was 60, 70, actually, 71. The Commission maintained its support for the implementation of the right to education throughout its existence. For example, in 2000, it called upon all states to recognize the right to education on the basis of equal opportunity by making primary education compulsory and the progressive introduction of free education. The Human Rights Council itself took up the right to education in 2008 when in addition to extending the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the right to education, the Council urged states to take measures to ensure an inclusive education system. Then we turn to human rights education the Commission first broached the specific issue of human rights education in 1971, when it asked UNESCO, and I quote, to consider, because it's important for what we're doing today, to consider the desirability of envisaging the systematic study and development of the scientific discipline of human rights with a view to facilitating the understanding, comprehension, study and teaching of human rights at the university level and subsequently at other educational levels. That was 71. 1973, the commission returned to the subject when it noted that a survey conducted by UNESCO of faculties of law and political sciences had produced some extremely interesting findings and that UNESCO had already adopted an intensive program of training in human rights. At that time, the Commission was favoring the establishment of a center for teaching and research in the field of human rights within the framework of the United Nations University. That did not materialize, as we know. By the 1980s, the accumulation of international instruments and special procedures led to a need for a wider knowledge of the scope and practical application. The introduction of human rights education became a necessary corollary of this development. In the late 1980s, we witnessed an enhanced focus in primary, secondary, and tertiary education and specialized human rights education, in particular in the sectors of administration of justice. The emergence of human rights education is therefore characterized by four milestones, and these are first, the World Public Information Campaign launched in 1988, which focused on putting the basics into place, such as the preparation of materials and setting up of networks. 
I was assigned to, to this particular task at that time. Then came the World Conference on Human Rights of 1993, which Manfred has so movingly recalled, and the ensuing decade for human rights education, which went up to, from 95 to 2004, and which really was designed to bring human rights education closer to the domestic level. The third is the World Program on Human Rights Education, which was launched in 2005, and which attempts to consolidate human rights education with the illness in that, pro in that program. And last but not least, the adoption in 2011 by the uh, assembly uh, of the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, by which the right to human rights education was formalized. Well, coming now to the World Public Information Campaign. On December 10, 1988, the 40th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Assembly launched the World Public Information Campaign for Human Rights. And this campaign, under this campaign, activities of the organization were to be developed and strengthened in a global, practically oriented fashion, engaging the complementary activities of concerned bodies of the UN system, of member states and NGOs. Please note the inclusion of NGOs there. In practical terms, this required dedicated support and input from the then Center for Human Rights. It was necessary to explain the UN activity, its components, how it worked, for what it worked, and with whom it worked. There were also specialized sectors that needed specialized attention, like police training, military training, and so on. Health. Most of the information existed in official documents comprising studies and reports prepared over the years. I remember a dear colleague referring to them as being um, pieces of literature that was impossible to understand. So in order to create and enhance awareness, it was necessary to rewrite them, to make them more easily assimilated and to make them accessible to a much wider readership. The first of the new publications, which was the fact sheet series, which still exists, was conceived to produce in easily understandable language, concise accounts of the various components and activities of the human rights program. These then were followed by the professional training manuals for more specialized use. The campaign, would ensure, the, the campaign was in, intended to ensure authenticity and uniformity in teaching human rights. And, and in his report to the commission in 1989, the secretary general outlined these activities. And I quote, 1988, the 40th anniversary year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights coincided with a new phase of UN activities in the field of human rights. The implementation of the body of norms available in the field of human rights clearly constituted a UN priority. The reaching of that objective on a global scale in its turn necessitated information leading to awareness and knowledge of basic rights and freedoms, of the machinery available for the promotion and protection of those rights, and of the role that the UN played in this crucial field. Indeed, everyone everywhere had a right to know of his or her rights. For while silence was all too often the accomplice of tyranny, Information was the beacon that lit the path to human rights and fundamental freedoms. Thus, a major objective of the world campaign was to build up a universal culture of human rights." End quote. By October 1989, these plans had materialized into activities that had taken off on an unprecedented scale. Fact sheets were distributed worldwide, teaching manuals published, as were other ad hoc publications. A study series was launched. Reference materials were updated and the official records of the Human Rights Committee were published, as was a collection of selected decisions of that committee. Training courses, seminars and workshops were organized worldwide. A consultation involving 12 agencies and programs of the UN system took place 
to coordinate activities and maximize the involvement of these agencies. Similar consultations took place with the Commission on Human and People's Rights of the Afri of now African Union, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, the Council of Europe, and other regional organizations. The campaign also targeted human rights, academic, and research institutions. These included the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the Institute of Humanitarian Law in San Remo, the Arab Institute of Human Rights in Tunis, which had just been established in 1989, the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights in San Jose, and the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights in Banjul, among other activities. The OHCHR website today, if you look at the under the publications tab, describes in detail the current status of these and the latest UN materials. In launching the campaign, the Assembly had called for the mainstreaming of human rights activities among the various departments and the other components of the UN system, such as UNESCO for Human Rights Education and the International Committee of the Red Cross for dissemination of information on international humanitarian law. Interestingly, the campaign catalyzed the emergence of human rights education in several countries at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels, as well as in specialized educational institutions, such as police academies and judicial training institutions, uh, training of administration of justice personnel, social workers, etc. Universities launched human rights studies courses and established human rights centers and institutes dedicated to human rights. Human rights non-governmental organizations took on human rights education and awareness building. Again, uh, note the reference to non-governmental organizations roles here again. This involved a number of professional or promotional activities. And these were undertaken by the Department of Public Information. As for example, 10 December 48 was designated Human Rights Day on the UN calendar and special events were organized annually to mark the occasion. 10 December was always a very special uh, day. And I remember in my early days in New York, there used to be a magnificent concert in the General Assembly Hall to mark uh, the adoption of the Universal Declaration. And uh, again, on the promotional activities, United Nations Information Centers disseminated basic information and reference materials on human rights and fundamental freedoms. I remember going to the Information Center in Sydney when I arrived there to, to uh, embark on my uh, academic career, uh, going there to pick up materials, which I had been involved with a few years earlier for my, at that time I was running the Human Rights Center at the University of New South Wales. Anyway, the contribution of the Department of Public Information in facilitating awareness of human rights continued. For example, in 99, DPI developed something called Cyber School Bus, an internet-based educational service that provided an interactive website for secondary schools. That same year, the commission encouraged governments to contribute to the further development of the website of the High Commissioner in particular with respect to the dissemination of human rights educational materials and tools. The website came into being in December 1996. The Commission urged the development of a national plan of action for human rights education and public information by all member states as an integral part of a broad national plan of action for human rights and complementary to other national plans already defined, such as those relating to protection of human rights of women, minorities, and indigenous peoples. Symbolic of the new dimension of outreach, you will be pleased to know that on 15 November 2008, the Universal Declaration was sent into outer space. The European Space Agency reported, quote, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was carried into space early this morning with the successful launch of Space Shuttle Endeavour from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. That was on 15 November, 2008. The campaign made it possible for the translation of the Universal Declaration into several languages and formats. 
as of June 2019. The Universal Declaration is available in 520 languages and various special formats. Other publications were translated into several of the languages. Now we come to 93 and the World Conference. The World Conference underlined the importance of strengthening the information campaign. It asked the governments that, that they should initiate and support education and human rights. They also said that the advisory services and technical assistance programs of the UN system should be able to respond immediately to requests from states for educational and training activities in the field of human rights, as well as for special education and their application to special groups such as military forces, law enforcement personnel, police and health profession. I remember in 1995, we organized in Geneva, uh, we tested some materials with a group of uh, military officers headed by General Obasanjo of Nigeria and comprising various high level star studded and uh, military persons uh, on, uh, on them for the first time. And it was, uh, it was a very interesting, if you like, culture uh, adaptation for us, especially, and I'm sure for them as well. The proclamation, the proclamation of a UN Decade for Human Rights Education, said the World Conference, in order to promote, encourage, and focus these educational activities should be considered. And certainly, in 1994, the Commission, consistent with this request, decided on a decade for human rights education with special provision for support of the human rights education activities of non-governmental organizations. Again, I repeat, mark the reference to non-governmental organization role. The cross-cutting relevance of the campaign to the activities of the commission was further affirmed in 1993, when the commission called upon states to join in efforts to introduce all round education as a matter of high priority and to include within it the subject of human rights, hence the marriage of education and human rights education. In 1997, the commission asked all states to continue to give widespread publicity to the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, in particular in the context of the public information and human rights education activities for the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, including through training programs, human rights education and public information. And it addressed, it addressed similar requests to the mandate holders of special procedures. Thirdly, the World Programme for Human Rights Education, which was launched in 2005. And here we start coming to a bit of lurching in this trajectory. Following the decade of human right, for human rights education, the Assembly proclaimed the World Programme for Human Rights Education in 2005, describing it as a global framework for human rights education structured in consecutive phases, each phase focusing on specific sectors. In 2014, the Council adopted a plan of action to guide the national implementation of the plan, including national midterm evaluations. Responses were limited. Only 36 states responded in 2017, and, only, and even less in 2020, when only 26 states responded. At, at the moment, the World Programme is currently in its fourth phase and scheduled to go on up to 2024. Finally, the Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training adopted in 2011. That was the work of the Advisory Committee, which is the successor of the subcommission who had kicked off the focus on education back in the 50s. The, the committee had prepared a draft declaration on human rights education and training, which was adopted in 2011 by the assembly. Interestingly, it's all interesting, but Article 2 defines for the first time human rights education. And uh, uh, here it is. Human rights education and training comprises all educational, training, information, awareness raising, and learning activities aimed at promoting universal respect for and observance of all human rights and fundamental freedoms, and thus contributing inter alia to the prevention of human rights violations and abuses by providing persons with knowledge, skills, and understanding, and developing their attitudes and behaviors to empower them to contribute to the building and promotion of a universe, universal culture of human rights. So 
we are still consistent with the attempt to bring about a universal culture of human rights. In addition to these four milestones in the development of human rights education, the Commission and the Council underlined the importance of human rights education in the wider context of the activities of their various procedures. This included the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, the Rapporteur on the Right to Health, the Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, for example. Other sectors were also addressed, such as those affecting women and girls, indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and the media. Also as regards security and armed forces and personnel, and personnel who may be involved in the custody of another person. It is also worth noting the establishment of a trust fund for human rights education, which was established in 93 to support the human rights program in Cambodia, following the signing of the Paris Agreement on 23 October 1991, and the formation of the UN Transitional Authority in Cambodia, which included the development and implementation of a program of human, human rights education, and which in historically, in fact, led to the first field human rights office to be established in 94. In 2000, the commission encouraged governments, specialized agencies and other organizations to provide judges, lawyers, political and other public officials, community leaders and other concerned persons with information and human rights education concerning women's equal ownership of access to and control over land and the equal rights to own property and to adequate housing. Now, some concluding remarks. If we go by the records of 1988 and consider the milestones we have highlighted, the approaches to human rights education give the impression, not entirely wrong, uh, of encouragement for their consistency and sustainability. Human rights education has contributed immeasurably to human rights awareness and a higher sensitivity to respect for human rights. As one traces this evolution, however, some questions arise as to future directions. And here are some questions that I believe we need to think about. First, is interest in human rights education waning? The reports of the World Programme and the preceding decade reflect a negative downward trend. Two, is the involvement of academic institutions being neglected? Should civil society not play a role in strengthening approaches to human rights? After all, they've been mentioned at least on three of these milestones. Should human rights education target large business corporations? Should human rights education extend beyond knowledge of the human rights program and reach out to the values that underlie it? Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this comprehensive uh, overview of uh, uh, the, the origins of uh, human rights education until the present day. And uh, I think the four questions you put at the end, <coughs> we will can kick off um, the discussion that we now will have in the panel of four experts. Um, and I <coughs> would like to go immediately to the panel. The first one uh, on my list is my colleague and friend George, George Ulrich, who has been <coughs> with the European Masters Program and uh, what is now becoming the global campus of human rights from the, from the very beginning as a European Program Director, two times as my predecessor secretary general of the uh, of the global campus um, um, and now academic director of, of the global campus and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we <clears throat> have both uh, people human rights experts and uh, educators from the University of Padua which was at the beginning of uh, what today is called the global campus of so Marco together with Antonio Babisca, they were the, the founders originally of the European Master Program and, and now the Global Campus. George, please. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, thank you, 
for um, Gilmarco, uh, Masha, for inviting me. And thank you, John, uh, for a very, very inspirational lecture, but even more so for a very, very important and rich book. As a, just as a, a beginning, I would like to also just take the opportunity to pay tribute to um, Antonio Papisca, who I think is the invisible presence bringing all of us together here today. And I was very impressed to hear Marco Masha remind us that the Human Rights Center in Padova was established in the same year as the Center for Human Rights in, uh, in Geneva. And I can well imagine the cooperation and contacts and mutual inspiration in the, in the early years. So um, I just wanted to make note of that. I, um, like Manfred, I, I was amazed when I received the, the manuscript of the book and was drawn into the table of contents uh, with, with great intensity. Um, and I really felt it was such a precious and valuable historical record, um, also because it not only documents uh, what has been done in and by the United Nations and Commission on Human Rights, but also provides reference to further research and sources and so on. And I think in that sense, it's an invaluable uh, uh, source. And I think for people like myself who are, into, I mean, I'm not that young, but I'm still a latecomer compared to, to you. And it's really a, a, an opportunity to learn and to understand the foundation we're building on in the, in the continued work we're, we're doing in this field. I think it's extremely important. I was very taken by the chapter on economic, social and cultural rights as a persistent theme of the, uh, of the commission, the special procedures and the history of the special procedures, the emergence of human rights law, of course. And, and now as we've been hearing about the, um, the um, status and role of human rights education in the work of the commission and subcommission on human rights. So it's testimony to, um, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable collection of source material, but I also wanted to say that it's, what really strikes me is just, it's a reminder and a document of just how rich the legacy of the commission on human rights is and a testimony to how creative and institutional organization that was. And that's sort of a, an important reminder, I think. I recall well in, in my earlier years in, in the human rights field, how the Commission of Human Rights was sometimes slandered as being, as Manfred said, politicized, inconsistent to some degree, chaotic, a forum for a plurality of different voices that were pulling in many different directions in a, in a sometimes messy fashion. And, um, and you know, I think that's, um, it's, it's very striking to, to take note of the outcome in comparison to the, the reputation, so to say, or the image. And probably the two are more closely connected than we, um, than we often recognize. You know, the fact of being a meeting place for so many different voices, for so many different actors, I think is probably very much linked with the ability of the Commission for, for Human Rights to assert such leadership. And I think this is where chapter one of the book is so important, is, is, is documenting the agenda that was, uh, and the way in which the Commission on Human Rights has been agenda setting and, and the subcommission. I think that's, that's extremely valuable to be reminded of. And I think one should somehow take on board that the, um, the slightly chaotic and, uh, and, and very diversified nature of the Commission on Human Rights, the cacophony of voices maybe even sometimes uh, has helped to, um, to, to establish the, the commission as a, as a dynamic, creative institution, as an incubator of, of innovation and so on. And I think it's, of course, it's extremely important to remember that, the, uh, that the, the years, the decades when the international community was most divided was the decade that gave us the, uh, the international framework of, of human rights law. You know? And I think the, the work done in the United Nations context is very much part and parcel of that. So, uh, so that's one of the, the, the very important lessons I take away. And I would like to sort of shifting to our topic on human rights education. I would like to speculate that we need a similar element of dynamism and plurality of voices and maybe even sometimes chaos to really make uh, human rights education rich and inspirational. You know, I, and I think that's, uh, that is part of the um, legacy that Antonio Papisca left us with in uh, bringing together different institutions uh, in, in a given continent and bringing in many different practitioners from different perspectives and so on. We in a, in a monastery on the Lido of, um, of, of Venice uh, are somehow creating, it's maybe an overstatement, but we're creating a commission on human rights in uh, a microcosm of, of the, the commission, so to say. And I think that something similar is being done in, in the other regional programs that now form part of the 
of a global campus. And I think that's a, that's a very important aspect. It's not just about a meeting of like-minded people. It's not just about a meeting of technical experts and so on. It's as much contestation, uh, challenging different viewpoints and, and a question of, um, of, of sort of learning and, and, uh, and emerging uh, enriched by, by these encounters. Um, now, the, uh, the Global Campus of Human Rights has been, um, uh, has a, a shorter history than the Commission of Human Rights, but nevertheless, uh, uh, also uh, uh, an important uh, history and uh, not only Antonio Papiska, but I would also really like to acknowledge Masha, Marco Masha's role in uh, laying the foundation for this. Um, we started as a European program. We were quite soon uh, replicated uh, in, with variations in the African continent, in the Balkans, and also in the Mediterranean region in Malta, as, as John Pace knows. Um, and since then, we have uh, we have uh, expanded to other regions: Asia Pacific, Latin America, the Cauc Caucasus region, and the Arab world. And it's uh, and in in every region, it's a it's a question of partnerships between institutions and, and actors representing different viewpoints, different disciplines, and, and so on. I think one of the um, very interesting, uh, or two interesting observations that I also take away from the, the presentation today are that um, how early both the Commission on Human Rights and UNESCO recognized the emergence of human rights as a distinct academic uh, discipline. So in parallel with the emergence of, of human rights instruments, laws and policies is also the academic uh, emergence of human rights as a focus of, um, of study. And as we were saying, a focus of study that requires both technical expertise and, uh, and also commitment, passion, ethos, so, so to say. Uh, in parallel with that, I think a very important is the, the way in which human rights practice or human rights work has emerged as a professional competence, a professional skill set. And, uh, and I think, again, that is very much part of the, of the history that's being told in John Pace's book. It's also an issue that Manfred has very much uh, uh, emphasized and contributed to in the evolution of the global campus educational programs, as has Michael Flaherty, for example, who's here in the meeting today and who's very much was very early in seeing how the experience of, of uh, work done in the United Nations context requires an uh, understanding of, uh, of, of what constitutes uh, common professional standards and so on. And I think that's one of the challenges for us in the global campus programs and human rights education in general to um, to take that on board. Looking forward, I find that, of course, uh, a lot has remained the same. We've grown, uh, we've grown over the years. I, I find, in some ways, we're we're being confronted with new uh, new themes and uh, and challenges that we didn't necessarily pay so much attention to in the early years of the master's programs we run, such as, for example, the issue of linking uh, challenges in the field of of human rights with the environment, for example. Um, we are now very interested in issues having to do with arts and human rights, which is, again, a, a field that is very rich, I think, and, and, uh, and we, we learn a lot from this. I see in the student body a strong focus on politics of identity in ways that we were not thinking about and so familiar with in early, earlier years of our master's programs and issues having to do, for example, with, uh, with um, populism and, and political backlash and, and, and many other challenges like this. But I certainly don't, and this is just now to go to your first question in the list, and that's the only one I'll, I'll, I'll speak to very briefly. I certainly don't think that means that the, the, the variations and changes, to me at least, don't, don't mean at all that the interest in human rights education is waning. Uh, in fact, I, have, I can report very proudly that our application numbers are significantly increasing in the last few years. We don't know if it's a general phenomenon or if it's COVID related or exactly what it is. But I think every generation of students that come to our programs is, is as committed as the previous ones and in their own ways as, uh, as uh, skilled and, uh, and, and promising. You know? So I'm, I'm certainly optimistic in that regard. And I'm sure they'll find enormous use for this, this compilation of, um, of uh, materials on the work of the Commission on Human Rights and the great enterprise. So thank you so much. Thank you, George, um, for giving us this overview also. Um, and I, I would agree that uh, if you look at the global campus of human rights, I would see 
the interest in human rights education uh, being, being uh, I think, even still on the increase. Um, <clears throat> we were just starting the first master in Vienna, linking arts and human rights um, and applied human rights. Uh, and we have quite, quite many of applicants. Um, now we are moving from the global campus to the University of Padua, and I'm welcoming uh, Paola Degani. This, this is the first speaker, <clears throat> and uh, uh, she's um, also the Italian member in Grevio, which is the, the group of experts on action against violence and against women and domestic violence. Paola. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. It is an honor for me to be here today with you. So uh, I'll have a, a very short speech as regard the development of women's human rights and uh, making specifically uh, reference to violence against women. So in my personal opinion, since the turn of the present century, the issues of women's human rights has elevated from the lower level of the international human rights system somewhere very near to the top, very familiar, very close to the top. This is primarily the results of feminist movement, but also of the legal and political development of the <coughs> UN body devoted to work in the field of human rights that fundamentally contribute to change the way through states and international community frame and respond to violation of women's human rights, starting from the work of the former Human Rights Commission. Human rights are political. How we define what human rights are was and also is today a common topic of discussion by individual people, non-governmental organizations and traditional political actors. In these last years, the attitude towards the systemic involvement of feminist network and non-governmental organizations have characterized the work of many UN bodies, in particular CIDAO Committee and the Commission on Status of Women, but also also other body contributing in a very concrete way to the process of positive and, spe and specialization of women's human rights. It is important to underline uh, uh, that also uh, lawmaking and more in general decision making processes that involve in adopting public policies and rule in general, not only political actors, but also many people as experts and organizations very often able to shape the political decision making process rather than to participate passively. Various group and organization which are member of civil society as well as a private actors and today involved not only in the process of implementation of public policies, but also in defining the institutional agenda and the timing of the process. This is absolutely true for many non-governmental organizations that have been involving, involved in developing international law or, or views or recommendation and formulating and implementing rules in general, starting very frequent from the area of the work of vulnerability that obviously don't represent the full dimension of women per se, or women in general or specify as a social groups. This process is very interesting because exactly as for the public administration and civil servant in Italy, this dynamics is largely present in regard to violence against women due to the lack of public welfare and the role of first sector in promoting women's rights with many different activity. Today, for example, this is absolutely evident for the debate on institutional victimization of women, victims of male violence against, against male violence against women as regard as the justiciability, in particular during the trial phases. To accreditate this work and also find a common frame and cognitive discourse, feminist movements, anti-violence center, many non-governmental organizations have been experiencing a lot of initiative of education and training, supporting opportunity 
for professional development becoming the core elements of a new perspective of horizontal exchange of practice and skills finalized to a more consolidated and integrated approach to tackle violence against women in the framework of the struggle against discrimination. Whereas an important work has done in these decades, violence against women continue to be largely present in our society, not only for the lack of services or for the lack of general awareness, but for the, non, for the systematic non-holistic interpretation of this situation, also in terms of human rights violation and their holistic means. In other words, too frequent the common perspective of the discourse of women position in society and violence in particular, tend to repropose a distance between public and private, denying the political dimension of the private that is violence. And this happens also in relation to legal perspective and to the justiciability of women's human rights. For example, in particular, in relation to child custody and the family matter in general. So training in terms of operative work and tools can help to work with a correct political level to dismantle stereotypes, giving to women a concrete difference to recognize really they need their dif the differences and their intersectionality in terms of perspective reality and combating uh, discrimination. In this sense, their contribution for a different perspective of human rights has been relevant and represent a very important way to support and, and to improve due diligence standard in a different way and to propose a view and a, a way to thought to image to reframe universalism very strongly based on a concrete dimension. May violence against women continue to be, to be discussed as an issue per se, but it is connected to power and to many other serious social problems. I think that many women in these decades have started to taste power, but only on the basis of the male model without having the possibility to work really in a different way, because to move on this direction imply a greater, com a greater commitment and a different idea of social justice really based on a human rights paradigm and equality. Patriarchy is broadly understood to capture the idea of male power over the female and international organizations starting from the UN have recognized that there is a great pressing to construct and to reduce the negative aspects of masculinity and to integrate men and boys into programs aimed at reducing violence against the women. Today, we are facing with the spread of populism and the serious cries of the rule of law. The success of European Court of Human Rights testified this fact in the Council of Europe contest, for example. And we know that in order to act democracy, we need of culture, of knowledge, of awareness, and of a thought that give us the possibility to imagine really a society based on social justice with an adequate place for women's human rights and for women women in general, women condition in general. So I think that in this sense, education and training for professionals, a stakeholder can help a greater role. And in Italy, in these last decades, we are working in a very strong way in this dimension. And it is very, very important to, to choose of framing male violence against women using this these tools, because in my personal opinion, human rights are tools. And I think that only in this way, it is possible to legitimize and to improve really this knowledge into practical dimension, also of judiciary, and also to, to, to combat the, the tendency against democracy in this historical phase. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, for linking human rights education to the awareness raising against violence against or on violence against uh, women. Um, and we stay at the University of Padua. Our third panelist uh, is we go from Paola to Paolo de Stefani. He also has been uh, very much from the beginning uh, together with Marco Marcia and Antonio Papiska in. Uh, uh, at the University of Padua and also very much involved in establishing the 
the Global Campus of Human Rights, uh, representing Padua at the European Master's Program. Um, and uh, he is now academic coordinator of the Master in Human Rights and Multi-Level Governance at the Human Rights Center of Padua. Paolo, please. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred, and thanks everybody who organized this, uh, this event on the occasion of the publication of uh, John Pacha's book. Uh, so I take the floor in my capacity as the academic coordinator of the Master Program in Human Rights and Multilevel Governance in Padova, and also as the pro tempore director for Italy of the European Master Program in Human Rights and Democratization in the Global Campus in Venice. And I take this opportunity to salute the many students from Padova and also from Venice, I suppose, that are uh, uh, following us uh, either in, on Zoom uh, or uh, uh, via Facebook. So my task uh, in today's conversation is to spend some words about uh, the importance of involving the academic institutions in this very great enterprise of promoting and protecting human rights. More specifically, I will talk about the current human rights related university programs available in Italy and in Padova. So, I will probably talk about uh, this uh, topic that uh, John Patch has suggested us uh, to, 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 to tackle. So the involvement of academic institutions in, this, uh, in these activities. So the purpose is not, uh, uh, um, is then to, to, to show, let's say, how our universities are involved in the global effort to implement human rights, uh, human rights education and uh, through education to enhance human rights, of course. So in several places, uh, um, uh, John Patch's books, uh, books stresses civil society's role, vital role in strengthening human rights via education and building education via human rights. Academic institutions and universities can legitimately, legitimately be considered part of the global civil society as such, they are endowed with the task of promoting human rights. Since uh, its inception, the academic community has supported the UN human rights machinery, and the ties between academia and human rights bodies have constantly developed. And the people we have here today, Manfred, uh, John, uh, Mark, etc., are examples of this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the granting of freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and the whole set of academic freedoms is essential for unfolding teaching and research at any level and in any field, both in hard sciences and in uh, social sciences and the humanities. All educational and scientific institutions owe a lot to the UN, to the UNESCO, to the UNICEF, to the WHO, et cetera, and to other international agencies and programs for their very survival. But on the other hand, critical thinking and innovative imagination are necessary for the conceptualization of human rights and for the progressive development of the human rights discourse, the human rights culture, overcoming any, any fixed ideological schematism and combating the sclerosis of worn out institutions. The University of Padova, on the initiative of the late uh, Professor Antonio Papisca, says that the proposal launch, launched by the UN and the UNESCO in the 70s, uh, in the early 70s, and the book uh, we are presenting today mentioned this at page 72, and uh, uh, John Patch has also quoted the same quotation I'm doing now. Uh, so the, uh, the duty to announce the systematic study and development of the scientific discipline of human rights, the scientific discipline of human rights, end quote. End quote. Um, so the, the UN, the UNESCO in the 70s uh, um, proposed to, uh, to, to, to establish centers for teaching and to do research in the field of human rights at the university level. This was also conceived as a means to disseminate and facilitate access to the materials on human rights, the international human rights materials, the books, the, the, the instruments that uh, uh, had recently entered into force in the mid 70s and then in the 80s. So this double call for awareness raising and for 
enhancing uh, scientific reflexivity on uh, human rights, legal standards on human rights, uh, led to the establishment, as Marco said, in 1982, of the Padua University Human Rights Center, uh, and then to create also a postgraduate uh, specialization degree uh, on institutions and techniques uh, of human rights protection. And this uh, course was established in Padua in 1988, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Marco Mascia has already uh, touched upon the, 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 the link, the strategic uh, synergy that Padua started to establish with the Human Rights Center in Geneva on these issues. Um, and similarly, also George Ulrich uh, has uh, delved into another major initiative of Professor Antonio Papiska, the European master's degree in uh, human rights and democratization, and then uh, the, the global campus. So I confine myself now to, to say, to speak briefly about uh, the current scenario of the human rights studies in Italy and specifically in Padova. Um, so the Italian universities are currently hosting a wide range of programs in, uh, in human rights. Bachelor programs are activated in Padova on uh, the title is political science, uh, uh, international relations and human rights, uh, but also in Bari, in Apulia, on uh, law, immigration, human rights and interculturality. And there are also master's programs uh, available in Bergamo, and the title is uh, Human Rights Migration and International Cooperation. I think it is interesting to, rem to, to, to recall the names of these okay. uh, programs. Uh, in Bologna, there is a master on international cooperation in human rights and international intercultural heritage, so human rights and intercultural heritage. In Perugia, the title is uh, European Juridical Integration and Human Rights. Well, in Padova, of course, uh, on human rights and multilevel governance. Um, as you see, bachelor and master's program are mainly in the area of uh, international relations uh, and uh, international cooperation. Uh, there is also at least uh, a dozen doctoral, progr doctoral programs run by Italian <laughs> universities uh, that offer research opportunities in this field. Um, mainly focusing on law studies, but increasingly uh, also adopting a multidisciplinary approach. What is still characteristic in the Italian academic landscape, at least, uh, is uh, that uh, whilst interdisciplinary um, is encouraged at the bachelor and master's level, as we have seen, doctoral studies and academic research in general um, articulate the human rights discourse mainly in legal terms and with a distinct focus on the normative dimension. Against this background, the University of Padova has, um, has an experience which is quite characteristic, quite peculiar um, and original at least, uh, but most importantly, most importantly consistent uh, over the years. So currently, Padua University offers uh, human rights degrees within the inherently, I would say, uh, multidisciplinary context of uh, the School on Economics and Political Sciences. Uh, the three-year bachelor program is attended every year by about uh, 500 students. As, as I said, is entitled to political sciences, international relations, and human rights. Students are exposed to topics, uh, a very wide range of topics, uh, ranging from economics uh, to law, from sociology to history, to study, uh, to, to regional studies uh, and uh, languages, of course. And the, the, the purpose is to study and investigate uh, the implications of any kind of political phenomenon and, political and policies uh, on addressing the, the whole spectrum of uh, fundamental rights. A similar perspective is uh, at work also at the master's level. So the master's degree in human rights multilevel governance that we run in Padova is conceived as, uh, well, first of all, an inclusive 
and world-oriented postgraduate course. Uh, established as an international program entirely taught in English since uh, 2013 or 14, with an average of about uh, 120 students uh, uh, admitted each, each year. So, and 70% uh, are uh, graduated outside Italy, so non Italian graduates. So, this master is a truly uh, multicultural learning environment. Uh, as uh, George said, uh, we are reconstructing, let's say, the, the dynamics that exist at the international organizations, at the UN, at the, at the council's level, because we have actually um, people coming from all parts of the world, more or less. Uh, so this is a dimension which is likely to unleash, of course, the potential of students with a very diverse background, both cultural, linguistic, uh, and of course, also academic to a certain extent. Uh, the program's design uses the language of uh, human rights standards. So that language that the commission has set up, has created, to establish links uh, between policies, experiences, practices, and struggles located at any governance levels and in a wide array of countries. So adopting a human rights-based approach makes such phenomena and policies uh, comparable, um, scalable, okay, and transferable. Human rights can indeed qualify in this context as a scientific discipline or at least uh, to be uh, an object of scientific investigation, of scientific modeling, scientific reason reasoning. Okay? So I conclude, um, and I will say that in establishing and developing uh, this academic frame in Padova, a bachelor, um, a national bachelor, an international master, and recently an international doctoral program, which is jointly run by Padova and other universities, including Western Sydney University, by the way. The University of Padova has consistently promoted the um, human rights education, I think in line with the recommendations of the UN, and eventually contributed, albeit uh, modestly, to this very great enterprises, enterprise that uh, uh, the book of uh, John Pache has uh, illustrated and, uh, um, and, and um, you know, um, reconstructed over the years uh, so um, masterly and so well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo, for this overview of uh, human rights programs at Italian universities and, of course, uh, focusing on the University of Padua, uh, which brings me to our last speaker today, Arianna Zaulini. She is the Chief of Advocacy for Save the Children Italy. Um, and there we see a very nice cooperation uh, between this major NGO in the field of children's rights and the, the University of Padua, who have established a children's rights chair for Save the Children, and you are the holder of this chair at the master program at the University of Padua. Please. Thank you for the floor and invitation, and you will join us in the end of the course, so you will see our students, uh, students on human rights. Um, as an NGO, I was, um, my role here is just to say uh, which will be, which is the role of an NGO in promoting human rights and which is the collaboration with all the other actors. Of course, working for Save the Children, for us, the, the basis is the promotion of children's rights that underpins all of our work, uh, from the emergency response, uh, response uh, to educational project that we run. And children are involved and encouraged to participate to all the initiative to promote their rights. So what we have at, as the basis of our work is that a right-based approach. Uh, Stefano before, Paolo before say about human rights approach. We have a rights-based approach and specifically a child rights-based approach that assume that people in our case, children are first of all uh, human rights holders and that the promotion, respect and protection of their rights 
um, is a duty of all individuals, but also about the collective, um, a collective duty of all the community. And I come later on, on this uh, issue. Uh, the right of education is, of course, the basis for uh, the development and is the most um, important and valuable tool that we have to um, uh, combating poverty and marginalization, even in a country uh, like Italy and in Europe as well. We know how high is the percentage of children living in poverty in Europe and, and in Italy as well. Uh, in Italy, we have now the new data that we have 1 million and 3,000 children living in poverty and education is, is the basis for fight against it. Uh, so we work to guarantee the right uh, to all children without discrimination, especially for children um, with specific vulnerability and live in, living in poverty. Uh, with the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, something changed, of course, and uh, is um, something that we have to keep on mind when we work even in the field of education, is the fact that uh, the paradigm change and children um, uh, become a right holder. So children are, need to be consulted and to be heard in all the decisions that affect them. Uh, of course, we would like to have a meaningful participation of children, and this is possible only if adults um, accept children as right older. And after 30 years of the adoption of the convention, we have to say that this, uh, this is something difficult to achieve, uh, and we are still working and, and lobby for, for, for it. And so children should be involved even in, in human rights education because it's a process when we work with children. This means that uh, uh, children should learn about their rights and those uh, and the rights of the others. Uh, of course, it's a long term approach and, and the aims of this approach is to make them understanding uh, of the key elements, but also to equip them uh, with the skill uh, to claim for their right and those of the others and to act to stop uh, and prevent human rights violation. So it's, it's, a, it's a more than a process when you work with, uh, with children. And keeping in mind the rights-based approach, this means that the trainer, the educator, uh, in our case could be our uh, educator, is, is, it could be the duty bearer, but it's a part of um, an educational relationship uh, by, based on the recognition of the student as a, a, a right holder. So uh, the possibility of the, for the student to interact with the, with the um, edu educator and, and uh, also to be part of the training, uh, thanks to the training activity proposed of, um, of the exercise and to suggest even uh, the outcome. So to be part of the process, this is very, very, very important, uh, especially when we work with children between 12 and, uh, and 18. But I have to say that uh, um, uh, there are certain, this is also because students, and as I refer to under 18, uh, but it's valid for everyone, um, when we talk about human rights, there are some key concepts that they, understand, should understand uh, the value that uh, they, they can understand. But the most important part is also to, to learn through experience and through practice and be them involved in the process of, um, of human rights and education is, is part of our, uh, of our goal. Um, just to give you a very concrete example of what we are running in very recent time uh, is the, the condition that we have after the pandemic. Uh, so uh, last June, for example, we launched a new program, uh, Rewrite the Future, specifically to address, uh, um, we have the ambition, ambitious to address uh, 100,000 uh, students, uh, but also um, the idea is to, to work with them both in a school and extracurricular process, because, because uh, the two of them are very important. And we would like to support a process, process of change in the school with particular attention to the most vulnerable area of our country, uh, of this big city. Uh, and the idea is also that through this process, through the participation, through um, the education and human rights education, we can also fight against uh, the early school living phenomena that is quite relevant in Italy, specifically in certain region. Uh, so through that, we gave the, the students, children, the opportunities for the present, but even about their tomorrow. 
um, it's important just not to work by themselves because um, uh, when we talk about educational poverty is something that deprives children and young people of the opportunity to learn, experience, uh, develop their skills, talents, uh, aspiration. So um, children and young, uh, young people who live in, the, in an area of the country where there are no services or they have no access to education or offers, um, the consequence of that is, of course, the exclusion from the society, but also uh, the sense of really of um, the possibility to develop their skin and um, discover themselves and so to have, to have access in the future of a, of a, in a job. So it's important that the, the territory develop what we call the educa educating community. Uh, so uh, educating community is an opportunity to prevent educational poverty and early school living. Um, because too often when we talk about education, uh, we, we, we think about students and uh, teachers. But uh, the idea now is that to consider that education as a matter that involves the whole community a community that becomes educating community. Um, SO is a network of individual with different experience and different knowledge and different opportunity to, uh, and to involve children, of course, in all this process, uh, so that they can share the responsibility of uh, educating children. Uh, so it's really um, mm, building an educating community means also to regenerate the territory. Uh, starting from children's rights uh, and promoting inclusion, legality, um, uh, environment issue, uh, the citizenship activi activities and have them involved really. Uh, one concrete example, we finally succeeded in run a um, good educational community pact last November in Naples. So it is a very difficult area to work with, but we have an agreement between school, local institution, the third sector, that means NGO, not just Save the Children, but other NGO working in the field. And they build together with a really, what we call, um, it's not a real contract, it's a, it's a pact in Italian. Um, and it's something that uh, make all them working together with different uh, specific specificity in order to, to empower children about their rights and go, go ahead. Um, it's very important to keep in mind, I, I told you about the pandemic and what happened here in Italy, but I think that happened quite over, uh, over the world. We are working hard to promote also the opportunity for students to have an opportunity during the summertime because the, the school were closer for a longer period of time. And so what happened during the summer normally is the, what we call the learning loss because they have a break, a long break. And this specifically have a um, negative impact specifically on children uh, that live in a disadvantaged situation. So uh, this phenomenon is particularly present in the, in the area a risk of educational poverty. So it's very important that we keep the summer and we, we build around the educational community the possibility for children and students uh, to, uh, to recuperate, um, to have um, the notion that they have lost during the, the, curriculum, the school time that is close, but also the motivation and to, to empower them about um, their rights. And also this will uh, provide them with, um, uh, with some uh, motivation, personal motivation to work on that. So to use this time to work on different aspects and also on to develop the resilience of the, of the children themselves uh, to elaborate what happened during the, the lockdown, uh, what happened during the, the time that the, uh, the school were closed, where they constrict in the family or in the house, we, we found very interesting to work with different professionality and to, to involve really children, make them powerful. So um, we promote a project, but it's really important to, to promote the, the psychological and psychophysical well-being of children. Uh, it's necessary to work in a, in not isolated, I must say, uh, not just with um, in, in a different um, 
you know, uh, the, the school uh, that uh, referred just to pro program concentrate on education, and you have NGOs, then you have uh, uh, other, for example, who take care about sport. We just try to make a community of different actors uh, and to work on, uh, on that issue. And I think it's really, really um, a good moment to, to relaunch the importance of uh, for children's rights in our case, but human rights in general, and the role that education could play uh, in the near future to, to really help these students to, to come over to the situation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, um, Ariana. Um, and I'm also happy that uh, <clears throat> you looked at uh, human rights education in relation to children's rights, but also on the child participation. I think it's a very important aspect, as you said, uh, but in order to empower children, <clears throat> we have to educate adults that they accept children as rights holders. Um, and that links again also with the global campus of human rights, where we have a very strong focus on, on children's rights uh, since, uh, since a couple of years. Um, I know that we are a little bit over time, but I <clears throat> communicated with Marco in the meantime, so we, we might go on with uh, until latest uh, 6.30, um, if that is fine with you. Um, on <clears throat> whatever comments or questions uh, in relation to John's uh, introduction, but also to our panelists. Uh, and I see Michael Flaherty, who has asked us the first one for the floor. Michael, please. Manfred, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you for a really interesting afternoon. A very wide range of topics thrown in there. I'd like to just turn to John and congratulate you, John, on the book. I, I've not seen it yet. I'm, I'm looking forward very much to reading it. And um, I want to express appreciation, John, not only for the achievements that have been mentioned here today, but also for your crucial role in establishing the UN program of technical assistance and capacity building, which has grown so extraordinarily uh, large over the years, but we have to remember it began with you in your office back in the 1990s. And it's in that context I first met you, and I still have really warm memories of how you took in this uh, new arrival at the UN and um, showed me the way around the Palais des Nations, so thank you. Um, but I, I want to put, a, a, John, just a question on an aspect of what I'm sure you cover in the book, but wasn't mentioned today, and that's the transition from commission to council. Um, do you think with the benefit of hindsight that a mistake was made uh, with the abandonment of the commission uh, and the development of the new model or on balance, are we in a better place because of it? Thank you. Thank you, Michael, very much. And uh, <clears throat> if others would like to speak, I think the easiest if you, is if you just use the chat function um, because I can't see everybody on, on the screen. John. Thank you. Uh, Michael, such a pleasure once again. <clears throat> and thank you for that question. Um, I always felt very disappointed that the Commission <clears throat> did not transit in 1993. I think by the end of the Vienna Conference, it was clear that there was a new agenda and there were new priorities, there was a new political thinking, such as it was. Uh, it was a golden opportunity uh, to, to uh, invest in a new uh, human rights institution. Uh, and therefore, I think in principle, yes, it, it should have been done earlier. But as has, been, as has been said, what has happened is that the Human Rights Council that we know today, with minor differences, uh, glosses, is not very different from what the Commission was. Um, it, it's, the ingredients have remained unchanged and therefore the taste of the dish cannot change, as it were. Uh, and that is why in the book, at the end, uh, the book proposes a new uh, permanent council consistent with the proposal of Resolution 60251 and indeed of the underlying report on of the panel on threats and challenges. In other words, uh, the time had come for, uh, and now even more so, because we see that there's, if there has been any change with the new council, to my mind, it has been not uh, more negative than positive. There are positives, but there are more negatives. There is unfortunately over, over the whole arrangement today, 
uh, what I call a stockade mentality by governments. The exclusion of NGOs from, for example, education issues, uh, not unlike the history of it beforehand, uh, from any meaningful participation in the work of the council. They have to lobby, they have to kind of do it in, a, in two seconds or half a second or whatever. Um, is demeaning and it's, it's counterproductive. And therefore, yes, there should be a transition from the commission, but indeed also from the current council into something where it, the, the playing ground is universal and flat, not limited membership. Limited membership gives rise to a lot of unnecessary red herrings. Governments criticize each other for being nasties. It, it's as though human rights membership has to be subject to a beauty contest. There is no such thing as a beauty contest in human rights. It's a universal duty by states in order to protect and enhance the dignity of the individual. It's as simple as that. And therefore the, the, the current mechanism has uh, eroded a lot of the gains of special procedures. It has eroded a lot from the uh, gains and the momentum of the treaty bodies, especially through its kind of indifference to the resources issues, for example. And therefore it has uh, eroded the substance of human rights education. What are we teaching when we teach human rights education? Are we teaching uh, as a, uh, holding up as an example, the current council? No, they make, uh, one makes a lot of uh, importance to UPR and no doubtedly it is. But like most international human rights issues, they tend to turn into a liturgy. They tend to turn into a ceremony. They become deprived of soul. They become deprived of substance, really, um, recommendations accepted or not. And then they turn into another beauty contest. Oh, we have a hundred recommendations. We took 10, we realized six, terrific. That's not the point of the exercise. All this in the context of the exclusion of the individual. The individual, if you re read the epilogue of the book, I will not belabor it here, but the formula proposed in the epilogue uh, tries to make things equal for everybody. The, the real universality, if you like. Yes, we need change, but the Human Rights Council is not the answer to that change. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I couldn't agree more uh, on, on, on your assessment. Any other comments or questions? from our participants. As I said, I can't see anybody on, uh, everybody on screen. So if somebody just wants to speak, just speak. I, I, I look more at the chat function. I, I hope I wasn't too sort of, but it's a very passionate, it's one of the chapters in the new book, by the way. Michael. Um, and there's a lot about the voluntary fund, by the way, as well, that we need to say, you know, the way it has gone. Um, and, and I mean, if I, if, if I may add to this question, uh, uh, because I was appointed by the commission, but I continued uh, uh, at the time of the, of the council, uh, it became much more difficult. Um, I mean, the code of conduct, uh, this whole idea of a code of conduct, uh, which we discussed for I don't know how long, and uh, states really, I mean, what, what they tried was we, we, we couldn't have any more press conference. If, it, if you do a fact-finding mission, uh, if, if you write a report, uh, then the state whom we visited has to agree with the way how we assess the situation in the country. This is the end of independent fact-finding. Um, and, and of course, it was long discussions and then there were all kinds of compromises. Uh, but I felt it was, it was more difficult and there was more interference with our independence during the time of the council than, uh, than at the time of the commission. And of course, also the financial resources got less and less. So, uh, so the, the support of special procedures was becoming much, much more difficult to really, you had to fundraise for your, for your independent uh, kind of uh, support outside the, the office of the High Commissioner. 
talking of the finance of the voluntary fund, by the way, I think it is useful for some reflection eventually on the role of the so-called uh, philanthropic capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's quite relevant in this day and age. And uh, I see quite, a, I, I see, for example, one spin-off, which is interesting, a group of Australian, fellow Australians, if you like, um, are going, have gone to the Human Rights Committee uh, against the government of Australia for having to pay $10,000 to, if at all, if they can get back at all to their country. Uh, because of the measures adopted by the government, uh, by the government, and uh, on the pretext of, of, of controlling COVID, um, and I think we have we're only scratching at the surface of this. Unfortunately, we do not see much reflection in the reports coming out from the High Commissioner yet on this aspect. We only see the repercussions equally tragic on uh, economic and social rights, but uh, I think they are much wider. Uh, human rights issues that are really quite closer to the core of the freedom of the individual uh, such. We can discuss that with great pleasure and, and I think we need to discuss that, at, you know, I, I would feel much more, uh, much more secure. <laughs> Yeah, we can do it with a glass of wine now after, after this uh, this seminar. Yes, yeah, that's good thinking there, Manfred. Yeah, may I? I still uh, because you in in your four questions you also said should civil society not play a role in strengthening approaches to human rights and in human rights education? As we have seen also with the uh, the Save the Children chair, this combination of um, academic institutions involving NGOs uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in human rights education, I think is extremely important. Um, and um, at the Global Campus of Human Rights, we try to do that as, as much as possible, involving, of course, experts from intergovernmental organizations, but uh, equally uh, NGO experts uh, in, the, in the practical education of what, what human rights work in, in practice actually means. But look at the chaotic uh, uh, feedback on the uh, program of education for human rights. And the, look at the last report in September last year, where you have phases that are supposed to be assessing each other and then the, on the interim, then they decide to revisit what they've done before. It's going everywhere and nowhere, you know? Uh, and that reflects the general culture that is uh, I think there's a gentleman who's trying to talk there. I can see his, but he's not he's muted. Yes, um, please. The iPad, uh, JP Cardoso. Yeah. Da please Costa, take the floor. Mr. Da Costa. You see, he's, he's, I can see him trying to talk. He's talking, but he doesn't uh -huh. have an icon. Maybe he's not talking to us, I don't know. Okay. Okay, are there any other requests for the floor? Any kind of comments or questions to any of our panelists? Uh, Michael, I will send you um, a, a flyer if you send me your email so that you can get a... Um... Yes. Yeah. I have Marta. Thanks, John. Thanks. Uh, I'll need your email. I'll ask... George or Manfred or one of the colleagues in Venice to send it to me. Yes. I'll, I'll be in touch, thanks. Okay. Certainly. Yeah. Marta, would you like to ask your question orally? Um, well, I guess it's fine. It's already written, so. <laughs> so I'm a former PA student in political science, international relations and human rights, now working as a journalist. Um, uh, what would you suggest to mainstream human rights education in traditional and non-specialized media outlets? Who would like to? John, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, it, it all depends. Um, if you're talking about uh, specific formats for, on, on, for, to transmit uh, the message of human rights education, um, you will see that uh, in regard to 
for example, indigenous peoples issues, uh, education relation to those, to that sector, to persons with disabilities, uh, formats uh, of transmitting the same substance have been developed as uh, so uh, it depends on the the recipient of the of the um, of the program but certainly yes uh, in fact the closer it is to traditional uh, values and uh, uh, the better i do not know if i have understood your question as intended but if not please let me know thank you Anybody of the panelists would like to add something? We have quite a lot of journalists attending our program, and I, I can say that, but that's a different issue than, than it, engaging directly with, uh, with journalism schools. And I could certainly see a value in that, just as there is a very great value in, in engaging with other disciplines, like medicine, for example, and, and many other fields. You know, and this is, I think this is one of the challenges also of many of our university partners to not just centralize human rights in an isolated center, but to really be integrated in the wider life of the university. And I think that's still a, a, a frontier that we need to, to sort of uh, approach, you know. I wanted to just go back to the previous comment you made, Manfred, and say that I think this, the issue of civil society and NGOs and so on as an integrated part of human rights education is valuable and important. In my experience, and it's increasing in these years, we, we find ourselves bringing back our own graduates uh, to, uh, to, to teach in our program. And it's a dual advantage be, because not only do they... Okay. No, just to say that it has a double advantage. They, the students can relate in a way to them as, as also people who've gone through the same experience. And it's really also about building character and community. And I think that's such an important part of human rights education. You know, so. Okay, I think we are coming to the, to the end of, uh, yeah, yeah. of this excellent that. seminar. John, would you like to have a final kind of concluding statement before I pass back to Marco Masha. Um, I hope that Mr. Da Costa has not been disappointed. I see him kind of struggling. What I wanted to say, first of all, a huge thank you uh, to pay tribute to Antonio Papisca, very dear friend, very, very dear friend and a pioneer, to Marco, to you, to the other panelists, to uh, the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, and listening to George and to uh, Paolo and to Ariana and to Paola and for their very valuable uh, con uh, contribution. I must say, I, I come away uh, encouraged and gratified at the same time. Um, and uh, I cannot, I, I do hope it would be possible to have follow-up sessions according to your own preferences. Uh, as I said, the book has everything. Incidentally, what you heard from me today is almost shamelessly lifted from the book. But uh, uh, I've done that in the, I think we've had now about eight or nine other uh, sessions on different topics on this book. And, uh, and I would try to do the same. The text that I sent to uh, Marco still has the footnote numbers of the book. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much. I'm very impressed by your work. I'm very happy with your work. I'm very encouraged with your work. You know, it is nice to see the continuity and the evolution and the development going on. And it, it is gratifying, really. I, uh, when I have uh, occasion to, to come over or to meet you again, it will be with really the deepest of, of pleasures. And uh, again, to see old friends like Michael, uh, like Cecilia and like Francois and so on. Um, it really is very, very nice and very, and I cannot thank you enough for, for, uh, for your time and for your kindness in, uh, in organizing this event. Thank you again, Marfred and uh, Marco. Thank you, John. Uh, if this was a real lounge of the book in person, we would now probably have some 10 or at least books there um, and we would perhaps even have the privilege to get uh, some of the books with the signature of you, John. Um, and uh, I mean, if there's a printed version, we would of course be extremely happy 
uh, if we could have it for our library and the um, monastery of San Nicolo, it, I, I assure you it will have a special place in, in our library as an, next to all the other big encyclopedias of international law and of um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights. So as a standard reference work uh, where students can go for whatever reason, whatever topic they want to do research, okay. there was certainly something the Human Rights Commission has said about it. And that's the starting point perhaps for their research. So I, I hope even if this is not in person, we might get hold of, uh, of one or the other copy of this, this excellent book. Thank you so much, uh, uh, John. Thank you all the four panelists for, for your thoughts and uh, very, very thoughtful contributions. Um, and uh, thanks again to Marco Maja and uh, the Human Rights Center uh, at the University of Padua. And I give back the floor to Marco. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, thank you. Thank to John, of course. Uh, uh, John, who, with his book, uh, gave us the opportunity uh, to discuss the topic of human rights education and uh, to spread the knowledge of the work done by the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. Um, in conclusion, the, I, I, I say, the pandemic has had a devastating effect on human rights. The way out of the crisis is human rights at local, national, and international level. All human rights for all. Eh? Investment in education is a long-term structural investment. It is a safe investment. Human rights education is essential for a plural, inclusive and democratic citizenship from the city to the United Nations is essential for democracy. Thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you all to all participants. Good evening, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye, thank, thank you, you Marco. Bye, bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Hope to see you, John, soon.